Good evening, everyone. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much for being here. We'll have a very interesting discussion with uh, the Minister of Digital Governance, Mr. Pierakakis. Minister, uh, digital transformation in, in the country is a sector that is very successful in the country. It has left a very um, high, very positive and, well, countable, tangible uh, footprint in uh, the um, um, citizens' lives and their interaction with the public sector. So in the next, well, 15 minutes that we have um, uh, at our disposal, I would like to talk about what we have s succeeded in the, so far regarding digital transformation. The second has to do your point of view regarding the future, where we need to focus looking forward, looking ahead. And the third, what we call challenges, some challenges that you foresee and how we could manage them. Now, starting with the status quo today, one of the traditional problems we have as the Greek society is this relationship of trust with, of, between citizens and the state. And it is undoubtable that the digitalization of uh, this transformation, digital transformation, the public sector has improved this uh, relationship of trust, uh, taking out the middlemen, the mediators and third parties. If we were to expand and enlarge on what we have succeeded in so far, from your point of view as the minister who was the leader uh, of this transformation, where would you focus if you were asked to talk about the footprint and the value for the country of these past three and a half years? Good afternoon. It is with great pleasure that I attend this event and let me reply by saying the following. A great part of uh, our results are already being, uh, let's say, uh, measurable and uh, some, other, some of the results are to come. For instance, we can count the number of services we had back in 2020 and the number of e-services offered today. Okay, we tripled them. That's something quantifiable. We used to have 501 services and now we have approximately 1,500. Uh, the interesting thing about that is that tripling the services offered, all those under the umbrella of egov.gr, had an effect on how they have been used because uh, they had a multiplying effect, a factor of 100. We used to have 8.8 .8 million, uh, million transactions uh, in 2018. They turned to 34 million transactions in 2019, uh, 467 million uh, transactions in uh, 2021, and now we have approximately 1 billion uh, online transactions. We're, we're talking about 1 million, 1 billion visits that never took place. This has also a very specific, um, let's say, imprint uh, on the, our economy. That's all, something OECD has already measured because we did an exercise. What is the excessive cost for our GDP before the crisis? That's something OECD did back in 2006 or 2007. Uh, our GDP was quite high at that time. Greece used to rank first uh, in terms of its red tape. Some some 6.8% of our GDP was uh, the cost of red tape for the state. I think that the result of all these uh, mechanisms, mythos, or uh, GAVGR, procedure simplification um, exercise, all these things added, it gave some added value to our economy. We will measure that value. Of course, in the course of time, uh, in the course of uh, time, uh, this affects how the public administration works, whether uh, the, whether the public sector uses these services, and how the job descriptions have changed. I think this is something we have to do in the second tenure of ours. But for the time being, we have already created a legacy of um, facilitation uh, for our service uh, for our citizens. Of course, it's far from that. Being digital is not just about uh, transforming the public administration. It's about transforming the private economy, telecommunications, digital skills. Our ministry is exclusively responsible uh, with um, telecommunications. In other domains, we have to work with other competent, co-competent ministries. But I think the, the footprint is something tangible. The imprint is very tangible. We, have, we can see that in every... Um, poll that takes place uh, measuring uh, the public sentiment, but we have a long way ahead. Let's stick a bit more to the present. Despite the uh, unquenchable progress that has been registered in the past years, I think our country is ranked 25th in the digital index of uh, IT and digital society. This indicator is being affected by a number of factors uh, in order to have our final ranking. 
What's your take on that about our position? What should we do in order to improve our ranking and close the gap? There are certain things that are properly displayed in the indicator. Some others do not. That's, and sometimes that's why we, more often than not, we give our feedback to the European Union in order to improve the indicator. There are two things not displayed in the indicator. When it comes to telcos, Actually, in the last version of the indicator, there was some improvement as a result of mobile telecommunications. Greece ranked 25th in mobile tele tele telecommunication. Uh, with respect to fixed line, we are ranked 95th. There's a huge gap that leads uh, to our bad ranking. In the case of 5G, we were one of the first countries to do the transition, and following the investments by the providers and the state, we ranked higher. With respect to optic fiber, we will exceed EU average within a very specific time uh, period. Talking about the provision of digital service by the state, if you check the DESI report, you will see that Greece has converged with AU average, and with respect to government services to citizens, we are already beyond the average. That's why the indicator doesn't count that. Half of the, uh, half of the weight, let's say, of this um, indicator has to do with, uh, uh, with a service offered to foreigners. Currently, we are translating the entire GovGR website to uh, non-Greek speaking people. So. We, are already, we have already exceeded the EU average when it comes to state services offered to the citizens. I think next year this will be displayed on the indicator. Now, talking about the skills and digital penetration to our society, things are a bit harder there. Uh, when it comes to digital skills and digital penetration, yes, we do have a penetration, but our companies are quite small in size. And you know that Greece, we, in the European sense, we don't have SMEs. We have micro-enterprises. I'm talking about people employing zero to nine uh, individuals. Uh, in Europe, SMEs means less than 250 employees. So uh, this is a, an equation which is far more difficult to solve. So that's why we have targeted programs to tackle this issue. Now, talking about digital skills, I think there is a global exercise to transform uh, educational systems and a shift from getting a degree at the beginning, getting a postgraduate degree later on in order to have a lifelong and ongoing process of enriching our knowledge, which in the future will be mainly digital. That's why we have a set of targeted programs mainly funded by the RRF. The main role is played by the Ministry of Labor in this respect. We have programs for the public administration for upskilling our civil servants, program for uh, upskilling uh, the members of the military. Uh, this uh, programs in the in the pipeline. Uh, we will see some progress quite soon. But when it comes to telecommunications and uh, the public administration, the state, we have empirically seen the impact of our progress on the indicator. And I think next year the DESI index will be more uh, illustrative of uh, telling of our progress. Now talking about the future. Let let us be forward thinking. What are the most important objectives or goals for Greece? according to you, in this quite successful journey of our country's digital transformation. For starters, we have a specific time schedule which had to do with our first tenure. Uh, what has been our goal at the beginning? A, to create the le necessary legal software, which means to promulgate all legal acts necessary in order to carry out uh, digital transformation as such. We did that at the beginning of our ten tenure and in midway, given the law 4727 of 2020, which at that time uh, has also been supported by the position. We were in the pre-electoral period as we stand right now. And the law on emerging technology that was passed in uh, summertime, talking about blockchain, AI, etc. So, currently does have the legislation needed for telcos and digital services. Tell you that, when it comes to telecommunications, we have been the first country to uh, harmonize our legislation with the EU directive on telcos. The second thing, and actually the most important bet uh, for us has been to offer very swiftly those services that we were in lack of. I'm talking about the daily lives of our citizens, uh, intangible e-prescriptions, uh, certificates, uh, um, solemn declarations, uh, issuing uh, driving license. All the things, these 1,500 services under, under gov.gr, plus the interconnection of minor systems, because nobody paid attention to that in the past, and we did that. Actually, it's being complemented as, uh, completed as we speak. Uh, very soon, we will have uh, the establishment of a private company uh, being done fully online. We will have uh, medical tests and examinations uh, by third parties included in the uh, My Test uh, uh, portal, and in a forward 
looking way. We will have RRF funded projects being uh, tendered online. Things that for the very first time we have the money to fund, we will do so. We will award the tenders. We will call the tenders online. So very soon they will be included in the existing uh, platform of digital means uh, that we use. This tendering will come in the coming months. Idika or ministries will be tendering major IT projects every month. These projects will take two to three years in average. I would say more like three years. So. By the end of, uh, of the next tenure, of the next four-year tenure, I think we will be ready to say that we will have a completely different state. This basically has to do with solving old pending issues. Uh, Greece um, uh, lacked a major uh, human resource management system or a proper ERP system. We didn't have the electronic medical record that many countries uh, uh, already had. We're talking, we're talking about this debate with the past of ours. So uh, what we lack, as uh, you suggested in your question, uh, what we want, um, the wagons that we have to catch up. For instance, AI-related projects that have to do with the health and uh, social security field, uh, the taxation issues. Uh, we have also the spectrum uh, auctions. So we currently have a fund of one of 100 million euros uh, worth uh, to invest in 5G. This is a project that currently debates or echoes in the future. Uh, but there are many, many things of this sort that have to take place. Our job is to produce a fertile ground for all these things to to boom, to, to bloom. Um, and of course, following that, it's not our job for these projects to be properly uh, to deliver. It's up to the businesses, the startups, research institutions, uh, incubators, in order to come up with new ideas that will help us unleash uh, our potential in Greece. I think what has already been made completely understood in Greece is that this endeavor is feasible. A few years ago, if we were to say that Greece, Bavaria, and Massachusetts, and that's my favorite example, uh, would be the first to come up with uh, vaccination systems uh, worldwide in times of pandemic, who, what will be the best? Nobody would vote for Greece. Ours delivered. Massachusetts and Bavaria's ones at the beginning failed to, uh, to, to, to deliver. Uh, then they did. This shows the quality of Greek software developers and engineers, the quality of Greek uh, agencies and uh, enterprises, and of course, the quality of Greek civil servants in this domain. So you have a good plan and you know how to properly structure it. You can uh, make miracles. And I think it has been proven already that there are no such thing. There are no wonders. There are feasible things that we can do on the field. Now. Let's go now to something that you mentioned before, the skills issue. According to the annual EY survey, the EY attractiveness survey, uh, and we uh, tackle the attractiveness of every specific location in terms of attracting uh, investments. So the first thing that companies tell us is the first thing they check is uh, the familiarization of the general population with technology in order to invest. So with respect to that, the familiarization of our general public of the population with technology. Where do we stand? And what are the next steps? There is some improvement, of course, but we still have a long way to go. To a great extent, uh, this improvement was uh, the offspring of necessity. During the 2015 capital controls, in times really hard for our country, people become familiar became familiar with web banking. During the COVID pandemic, another hard time for uh, our country, in which, of course, the state responded completely differently. People became familiar with digital services because the state had to keep on running. Uh, businesses have to achieve their business continuity, and we had to attain our gov government continuity, which means we built GovGR in order to serve our citizens at home. So lots of people learned how to digitally interact with the state. Okay, it was really helpful that we designed things in a completely different way. We made our platforms more user-friendly, more attractive, uh, aesthetically speaking. But although for more countries, the shock of this change um, reflected on a, a change in demand because of COVID in Greece, the main um, impact was the fact that we tripled the e-services offered, which of course was coupled with a change in demand, but that was not enough on its own. We have to be very 
to work very on a very in a very targeted manner when it comes to skills because you have a part of our population that lack basic uh, digital skills. That's why we have certain programs like the Digital Custodian, let's say, um, freely translated, or the Digital Academy offering uh, content free of charge. None of these things uh, is perfect. None is able to give the full reply needed. One has to create a jigsaw and take each one of these things in order to complete the jigsaw. So. One thing we have to do is to work in a targeted way in order to reply to something similar to what you just asked. There are many businesses, especially in technology and in startups, try to find people to work to, to, for them to recruit, but they cannot find them. Although we have a lot of unemployed graduates of STEM courses, chemists, physicists, uh, mathematicians. So if we have a very targeted upskilling uh, courses, it will be very easy for them to learn how to code and find a job. So we need targeted programs for them. Oh, we can go to the military. What other countries uh, do uh, during the military service of the citizens? Do, can we introduce these upskilling programs do, uh, that will uh, be offered during the military service of our citizens? What can we learn from Singapore or the Irish or the Finnish? Or the Finns, actually. So it's a, it's a puzzle. Depending on where we stand, depending on the on the age of each individual, is it a kid? Uh, so he or she has learned more skills compared to the ones given at school. Or are we talking about someone who has never been in contact with digital skills and he has to learn something quite simple? We, from our part, has to take it step by step and add something to this mixture. To this mixture. We have to see what the civil society may offer. And all these things together have to be part of a national-wide uh, comprehensive strategy. I think it is more than necessary for this to happen. But if you, um, in the for, in the long term, it's not just about covering the digital, uh, the, the skills gap of our population. The important thing is to decide how our educational systems will be orientated because the life expectancy increases. Technology uh, takes up sc uh, speed. We will do more things. Children now in the kitchen garden or in nursery schools will have more than two or three careers in their lifetime. So the educational system has to change with respect to how we upskill our people. And uh, we have to review the kind of upskilling courses we will offer in the future in order mainly to change the culture of people that, yes, they will have multiple careers in their lifetime. So digital education, which experience shows that when it comes to um, skill acquisition programs, uh, Corporates and enterprises are much better than traditional uh, formal educational uh, schemes because they know how to train you in a corporate environment. So there are many things that we can learn from them, there are many things that universities can learn from major uh, companies uh, and their experiences when they recruit people and they upskill them. So how all this thing may be, let's say, squeezed, um, um, formulated in a question, in a question that no country has been able to answer yet. And given the uh, skills we have uh, on the field, let's find out the right reply. I wish that, I wish that, that somebody uh, uh, took account of what you said about the military 24 years ago when I did my military service. Let me say that somebody thought of that in the past. If you check what your grandfather used to narrate, uh, is the following. They used to say that they learn how to drive during their services. They learn how to become cooks during their military service. I have a relative who uh, was trained a uh, barber during his military service. That was a skill acquisition process that was lost in the process. Uh, it's We have to change, we have to learn how to do that in a different way now. And we can do it as, as long as we, end, as we introduce digital skills. And more than digital skills, any skill may be certified during your military service. Uh, that's a project um, embraced by the Prime Minister, Mr. Mitsotakis, and of course the Minister of uh, Defense, Mr. Panyotopoulos. There is money earmarked uh, during the, in the RF. We're going to do it step by step, but we have to complete it. And that's something that we can do and actually has been done in the past. One last question. I uh, have 60 seconds. You talked about the offspring of necessity. And may, perhaps one of the evils during the adjustment pro period, uh, the, the rate of recruiting people in the public sector uh, was accelerated. As a result, we have a percentage of young people who work for the public sector. In the age group 18 to 34, this is one of the lowest rates in uh, amongst the OECD countries. I think it's uh, quite low. So how easy does it make it for a minister to promote the digital transformation of a country? The challenge is huge. 
Uh, but let, let's go one step back. Uh, for starters, it's one thing to be able to attract talents in the public sector. It's much more differ, difficult in the public sector because the delta, the differential for an engineer, for the mathematician uh, in, uh, between the private and the public, public sector is huge, especially when it comes to the uh, fees they get paid. The second challenge, which is a bit easier to tackle, is the following. How can we invest in talented, qualified people we have? We haven't done that in the past. We can do it now. For instance, the General Secretariat of IT Systems, uh, the tech of IDICA, uh, features some amazing um, software developers and engineers. We will invest in them in order to be fully acquainted with cloud technologies, Microsoft, AWS, or Google-sponsored uh, cloud services. So they will learn all of them so they are able to choose the right pathway for them because it's up to them, not up to us. So in this sense, this entire exercise is a very difficult one for the coming years. We believe that the digital transformation program will change the allocation of, uh, of jobs in the future. We will see about that. In the, um, and, and then another issue, which is, uh, and of course, this is a global issue, and we'll try to find the right answer ourselves. Thank you very much, dear Minister, for this very brief, quick, but uh, really dense uh, discussion we had. Thank you very much.